Welcome everyone. This is the Reimagine series and today I've got Anna Barlow, currently Chief Innovation Science and Innovation Officer. That's right, yep. Yep, at, at Asahi. And we are chatting about Asahi, particularly in, in, in the FMCG space. And, um, and I'm not sure if you're too familiar with, with the show, but what we're trying to do is you know, get people out of the headspace they're in a little bit, talk about what's working, what's not working in terms of innovation, um, to reimagine as per the title. And, and um, you are long for that power networking event. So you get it, right? We're trying to just um, uh, focus on what's working, get people, you know, thinking about the future, working alongside the disruption and not, you know, waiting for, um, waiting for it to pass. Um, so can I, can I start, you know, by going back a little bit with, um, can you give the audience a little bit of your background and how you ended up at Asahi? Sure. So I've been working in FMCG now since around 2008, uh, when I started working for Cadbury in New Zealand. Uh, prior to that, I'd been working inside universities, um, both as an academic, but also um, working on the business management side, connecting companies um, with the, I guess, capabilities with inside the university um, that I was working for at the time. And then in around 2008, I joined uh, Cadbury in New Zealand and started looking after the science and technology team there, the product development, packaging, that kind of thing. Uh, soon after that, about two years later, I moved to a global role and uh, spent um, a couple of years working for Cadbury, then Kraft Foods, and then Mondelez as that company was acquired and then um, again, divested, I guess, uh, into Mondelez International uh, when I moved back to Australia to lead the Asia Pacific chocolate, premium chocolate R&D team. Um, a lot of chocolate. A lot of yeah, chocolate. a lot of chocolates. I spent a fair <laughs> bit of time working in chocolate. Um, for a while, when I was in Europe, I also worked on the biscuits category, a little bit of coffee and gum and candy, mainly on looking at long-term technology development programs for those particular categories. And then in 2014, I took uh, maternity leave and sort of late 2015 moved to the UK again, um, this time with uh, Jacob's Joe Egberts or JDE Coffee, which is um, a joint venture between Mondelez and um, what was the Dow Egberts company. Um, at that stage, it was uh, under the ownership of a, a German, I guess, investment team. Right. So chocolate and coffee, there's lots of fun stuff in there. Yeah, all my favourite things. I've been working, I've always said that when I was working in chocolate and then in coffee that eventually I'd end up in alcohol. So how I came to Asahi was uh, <laughs> this role came up in, in uh, Australia. And yep. I've been here for just on two years now. Fantastic. So leading the science and innovation group, which is a combination of R&D and also the, the innovation culture change uh, for our business. Yeah, so um, interesting, right? Because it's, you know, I guess what, what I like to hear is how kind of each company does innovation, you know, differently, right? And I mean, it's because innovation is different to different people, right? And, um, but it seems that there's quite a, been um, quite a heavy reliance or um, uh, process that has to do with research and development. Can you explain how that kind of, is that, is that experimenting in the labs and coming up with innovation there? And how, how, does, how does the process kind of work yeah, so for me, my, the, the majority of my innovation career has been on the R&D side. So um, I'm a chemist by training and um, been working really with um, plant chemistry um, since I did my PhD. And so chocolate effectively comes from cocoa, that's a plant, so does the sugar. Um, coffee comes from co uh, coffee beans, that's a plant, and uh, now beverages. And we work uh, with a number of different plant-based things, whether they be juices, whether it comes from barley and hops, which makes beer. And so for us, we're really looking at new and innovative ways that we can create beverages um, from the different ingredients that we've, that we've got. And so I'm looking at a number of innovation programs that fit in that space really from the R&D side. And is that like just crazy chefs in the kitchen kind of stuff? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think uh, probably not quite so much of that. I think, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we, we are innovating for the mass market. And so, you know, really crazy chef stuff is probably more for the, the startup space than it is for the big companies. Although, you know, we, we of course have a lot of fun uh, making new things. Yeah, I was just, th it just came to mind, you know, I was working with a, a group called the, the, literally called the wine group. And they would have, you know, one of the founders, he would just go missing for two, two, two days or something, trying to create a new wine. 
and they're just like, leave him alone. He's going to come up with some, <laughs> something, something genius. Yeah. Um, so is that, is that, is that innovation that is driven by marketing and then, you know, or, and then, you know, you know, internally asked, you know, the R and D team to go, look, we're looking at this flavor. We're looking at this kind of thing. Or is it a bit of both? You know, it's, it's definitely a bit of both. So we, we spend a fair bit of time trying to understand what the consumer is looking for. Um, so when I joined the business a couple of years ago, uh, I brought in a new function called consumer science, which is how he hadn't had um, for a very long time. I think within the back in the days of Cabri Schweppes, um, the Cabri team had a consumer science function. Um, and the consumer science is really looking at understanding what the, both the, the physical and emotional needs of the consumer are. And then you match that with, you know, what the brands um, can deliver. So your ultimate goal is to have a brand that, um, that resonates with the consumer from an emotional perspective and that the product and the packaging also meet um, what the consumer is looking for from an emotional and physical need perspective. And, and so we, we spend a fair bit of time at that front end, really understanding the consumer. Can, you, can we dig a little bit deeper in, into this? Because I, lo I love this kind of topic and, and um, you know, Firstly, I, I think that, you know, you know, we kind of preach this at Startup Bootcamp where, you know, you got to get back to talking to your customers and, and oftentimes it some, somehow gets lost or, you know, I think we had a conversation some time ago where it was also, you know, getting lost in the business because um, we start to focus on the customer being the, the wholesaler or, or, you know, whatever else and not the, the end user. But can you just talk a little bit about this um, in the, the emotional needs, because I kind of find it, you know, really fascinating to um, how that translates to flavors or packaging or, or whatever else. Sure. So I think um, when we're looking at whether it be, you know, a new beverage or a new coffee um, in my previous role or a new chocolate, what we're trying to understand is what is the job that the product's doing for the consumer? What space are they in? What occasions are they consuming the product? So within the beverages category, you've got the obvious things which are more physical needs like refreshment or hydration, but you've also got things um, which say, what does this brand say about me? How do I want to show up? Who, uh, um, who am I when I'm drinking this? What do I want people to think of me? And all of those things can lend themselves to both what the brand says about you, but also how does the product deliver on, on that? You know, for something that you want to be really refreshing or hydrating, you really don't want it to be overly sweet. And so the consumer science team will work with our product development group and our brand team to really define the, the product design rules or the packaging design rules that meet those needs and also fit with what the brand equity is looking for. And, and does like, you know, I only because I know like a little bit about the space, how early do you kind of involve the buyer, right? Because I'm just like, I mean, it's a tricky one when you... Um, you know, I guess, you know, the Australian market and the kind of the, 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 um, the power of, of some of the big retailers, I guess, is that, um, you know, they kind of dictate what's there. And it, I mean, it, there must be some times where, you know, there's a demand, the customer loves it, you got validation, the packaging suits, but it ultimately could fall flat because, you know, one of, the, one of these big uh, buyers don't want to range it. Yeah, and, and you know, you, you have to look at both the consumer but also what the customer is looking for. So you need to make sure that they've got shelf space and that they, they buy into the consumer needs. So, you know, our sales teams spend quite a lot of time with our customers, both our big major customers, but also some of our smaller customers, you know, understanding how they see the category changing. Um, that's, that's really key input because there's no point in us coming up with something that has the best consumer need in the world and then a customer not buying into that. So it's an ongoing iterative process that happens not just through the standard, you know, sales or range review timings, but in all the customer engagement, you know, we're constantly talking to customers around you know, how we're doing innovation. And, you know, over the last sort of nine months prior to COVID, um, I've been working quite closely, particularly with our on the go sales team. Um, we did some training and innovation um, consumer understanding or customer understanding earlier this year. And I really think that's, um, you know, really adding value to what they're doing in the conversations with customers. Because more and more customers are also asking us to demonstrate what we're doing in an innovation sense. And then how much, like, is it, um, is it a matter of, I'm um, just, constraints within um, um, 
manufacturing is that all kind of considered too i just under, like understand like the the dream versus the reality of like what you know what bottle could actually be used and how early are you kind of like bringing in thinking down the track if, if that but makes really sense. depends on, on the program so you know in the last two years we've introduced um the signature series range in schweppes and that was a brand new bottle, which took, you know, the packaging team a fair bit of time to, to design that bottle and make sure it would run down the line. And those sorts of changes are big investments when you're dealing with bottle, bottling plants. You know, they, they run fast and they put through lots of volume. So when you're doing a test and learn, we tend not to put those things straight into our large factories. Um, we would tend to work with co-packers or, or manufacturers that have got a little bit more flexibility at that stage. And I think um, we've had good experience um, over the last few years working with co-packers when we've got perhaps smaller volumes that aren't quite ready for our larger factories. And you need that kind of relationship to be agile and to test and see what will work and what doesn't. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, this kind of brings it to a perfect um, segue to like de-risking innovation, I suppose. And, and, you know, um, you know, we, we, you know, we, I'm, I know that we've been partners for some time, so I know how sophisticated your, you know, the, your uh, innovation army is, because you work with us. <laughs> That's very handy. Um, but, um, you know, the, the getting in front of the customer, the de-risking innovation process, I mean, how, do you, how have you seen that evolve from the, you know, $10 million advertising spend that, you know, because head of marketing thinks it's the best idea and everyone, you know, agrees. How has innovation changed in, 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 as you've seen over the last few years? I think that's where your customers come in as well, because when you've got great relationships with customers, you can do small tests and learns with them. So, um, you know, I think we've had some examples where we've been wanting to test products um, to see, we might do a state-based trial, for example, where we put a, a product that we think is, is um, you know, absolutely got legs, but we want to prove it to ourselves as well. We might test it in one state first. We might test it instead with a number of customers just in a few stores. Um, there's, I think... Other ways you can test and learn, um, you know, in the last 12 months, we've also introduced our own direct-to-consumer platform, and so we can test products on that. Um, internally, we run a number of um, programs that we call lovers panels, where we might test prototypes with those before they even see the market. You know, we, we're sending them out to, to our staff, um, you know, who are based all over Australia at our factories and sometimes aren't across what we're working on from an innovation perspective. So they will give us feedback. Now, we did some great consumer research um, with the children of our families just to understand how, how kids interact with packaging. Um, and that's a, a great way because it doesn't cost a lot of money and it also engages, you know, your staff in the brands that you have and also in the development of, of, of changes. Well, I'm guessing the kids would be, the, you know, they're probably the most brutally honest Yes, uh, my, my daughter took part in that. And uh, yeah, the, the thing about videos is that you capture everything. So uh, the good end of that. <laughs> Well, that's great. Like, I mean, it must be hard sometimes when you've got like, I mean, you know, just pr past experiences. We got focus groups or something where you, they're, they're paid and they maybe prevent them from, you know, like, you know, uncovering the actual truth, right? Um, mm. Yeah, I think there's still a, a place for focus groups. I mean, we still use them quite a bit, but we, it really comes down to the skill of the facilitator. And, yeah. you know, when we're trying to understand the pains or gains or, or jobs to be done, we'll put lots of different products in, into consumers' hands and we'll ask them to, to separate them by, by whatever um, attributes they see. And so you're engaging them in much more and you start to see them after a while demonstrate their real behavior, not say group think. Um, yeah. Yeah. And some of the research we've done recently um, into our beverages, you can see that, that coming through, um, particularly when it comes to flavor choices. If you're not, you know, creating something completely new, um, it can be quite useful to, to use focus groups um, and, and give them a chance to play with the product. Absolutely. And is there also like a uh, influencer kind of group? That you, that you kind of... Yeah, we do have an online um, panelist group. Um, I wouldn't say they're influencers as yet, um, but they certainly are a group of consumers that we connect with regularly to talk about our products and get feedback from them, um, yep. which is uh, an external consumer group. Um, so there's several thousand members on it um, that we connect with. Well, and and how, how honest are the, um, the employees? Oh, very, yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> Very <laughs> safe <honest>. place. <laughs> and then, um, and then, you know, like, okay. So another thing, there's so many topics here to, to cover. I'm just like writing notes madly. I was, I was actually on the, uh, with the call with IBM and I'm looking at the video and I'm thinking, I'm just down here writing notes. And I think that he was, it probably looked like I was on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> right? It was just like, this guy's like, this guy's lost yeah. interest in me, but I'm just writing notes for anyone that's worried about me losing focus. Um, the idea that, um, this move that is a bit tricky in terms of um, uh, direct to consumer is mm -hmm. is that is that somewhere somewhat we can somewhat we, something we can talk about? I think we can always talk about it. All right, good, good, <laughs> good, but it's just like I mean, I'm trying to think like because I know um, you know a few big corporates in the same boat where it's just there was, you know, it's a difficult thing because you've got the pandemic and you've got mm -hmm. you know, um, you know the 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 demand for e-commerce and um you know uh, uh, i guess it's um convenience really right at, at the end of the yeah. day but um versus you know long-term um partnerships you've had with you know wholesalers retailers or whatever how do you manage that now given the current climate i think you have to do both right i think you know it's really really important probably more important to have great relationships with your customers and understand how to help them drive their e-commerce business. Now, at the end of the day, it's not just, you know, everybody's looking at online. Um, you know, consumers are scared of going to the supermarket these days. Uh, they don't know what they're going to pick up. And so, you know, and also that's the convenience. We sell a lot of products in bulk packs. Those are heavy. Yeah. And, you know, for, from a customer standpoint, many dark stores are appearing and those larger packs are really, really great for the dark stores because they can be delivered direct to consumer and they have a, you know, a bulk pack. So we are also working with our customers on designing the right pack for them, for their e-commerce business. And then for us, the, the ability to test and learn with our consumers directly helps us deliver then a better offer to our customers at the end of the day. So, you know, it, it's, it's a combination of both. I don't think one will ever replace the other and I don't think it should because um, yeah. consumers demand choice. They want to be able to shop when, when, where it suits them. Exactly. And, and, and then what has like, what has been like, um, I guess, a surprise or surprisingly beneficial, um, you know, to the business given the pandemic, right? Like, because I think it's, you know, we spoke in the power networking about like kind of uncovering inefficiencies or, or, or whatever yeah. else. Has there been any like benefit, like immediate benefit that comes to mind? Um, I think there's been a couple of things. One that it's, it's uh, you know, we've had a lot of, um, people really wanting to work flexibly for a very long time. I think most companies have had that pressure coming through, particularly from the millennial um, age group of, of employees. And COVID has proven that that works. I think there's also just as many people that really like the office culture. And so it's trying to find the right balance between, you know, as we are able to go back to the office, what is the right flexible working policy? So there's benefits around that. And I think we, we've shown that our IT systems are capable of, of operating in that environment, which you know, a lot of people weren't convinced um, would be the case. I think from our perspective, we did a test a couple of weeks before the, um, you know, the, the mandatory staying home period started back in March. Um, that worked really well. And we've relatively seamlessly moved into this new way of working. So I yeah. think some of that will be retained. I think you also have to work harder to collaborate in an environment like this. Um, you know, you, you have to pick up the phone because you're not just going to run into people in the office. Yeah. Um, I think also, you know, from a consumer standpoint, we're seeing patterns of consumer behaviour where they're moving more to the familiar, things that they've known, because this is a very uncertain time for a lot of people. And so they're gravitating to things that they know well. And so, you know, some of the products that we've been making for a long time, we're selling more of than we were before. Right. And, and yeah, it's interesting, you know, the work flexibility bit, um, because, um, yeah, I mean, it's different now, you know, from Melbourne anyway, right? Because we're in this kind of lockdown. It's yeah. like, yeah, just let me out. <laughs> um, I've had enough flexibility. I want to go see people. <laughs> oh, yes, I can relate to that. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to schools going back. <laughs> I think. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that was. And I, I really enjoyed the human side. That you know, pretty much everybody has dealt dealt with either you know children at home or at, or an environment at work which hasn't been ideal. Um, yeah. And that's been the humanness of that has been really enlightening. I think. Yeah, and uh, I mean, it's it's interesting because, uh, again, you know, referring 
to the power networking bit where um, um, there was that the comment around, you know, we used to do zoom to avoid people <laughs> <laughs> and now we're like, you know, we're actually connecting with, with colleagues and stuff. I mean, there's definitely some benefit to, you know, but I guess being more thoughtful and, and, and to your point collaboration. Um, and then what are, um, what are some of the, the trends, the trends you're, you're seeing at the moment? I think as I said to you before, the, um, the, the, the reaching for the familiar um, is certainly yep. something that I think most businesses are seeing happening in, um, in the FMCG space. You know, I've got friends who work um, in, in the chocolate business and from, from my days back there, and I think you know, chocolate is a, is a treat and it does pretty well in times of recession. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that there's some pretty happy chocolate makers around um, as an example. Um, in, in our situation, you know, people are, obviously there's, the, the impact for us is that the bars are closed. Yeah. But as a result, people are purchasing, um, you know, more of the RTDs and things to take home, uh, which you'll see in, in any market data that you look at at the moment. So, yeah, I think it's, um, <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a very different environment and uh, behaviours are changing um, quite a bit. The other trends that we're seeing, I think, are around um, health and, and well-being. So you're seeing... It's, it's pretty hard in this environment to, to get that golden triangle of sleep, exercise and food right. And so people are focusing on the bits that they can. You know, there's less commuting, so people are making more of an effort to, to, to exercise. Um, I certainly see that. I've never seen so many people out walking um, when I go out now as I, as I used to. <laughs> so I think they're really relishing the one or two hours out a day that they're allowed. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I just did see... Um something where Microsoft was now adding some sort of 15 minute um, virtual commute to the, the Teams product, mm -hmm. which is, which is, you know, um, I love this innovation, right? Because yeah. it's just like um, that, um, I don't know, ability to kind of reset, retune, and then I'm going somewhere else. I had, well, uh, that's what I, I mean, I don't like my commute. I, I, I choose, I've chosen to live on the, on the far east of Melbourne and uh, that results in normally a one and a half hour commute for me some days on a really bad Melbourne traffic day. But yeah. I, I'd gotten used to that and I've been listening to podcasts and audio books. Um, I haven't had to do that now since March. So it's something that I'm, uh, I'm I think it'd be interested to see whether there is an increase in, in consumption of audio books or a decrease as a result of people not commuting. Yeah, and well, I mean, so it's just, um, yeah, I got same thing, right? I hated the mm -hmm. hate the traffic. I'm in I'm in Black Rock, or so you know, down down the beach there. But um, so yeah, but but yeah, I guess maybe 15 minutes is a nice time. Like if we yeah. live 15 minutes, like, um, and then um, you know, it's interesting how people kind of can transition, right? Particularly from lockdown, trying to think about all right, this is home, this is work. Mm -hmm. um, is there any 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 tricks you've got? I'll I'll give you uh, one of the the most interesting where um, we have a, a client in the TTA TTI space where he would change his pants when he went inside. <laughs> well, <that's>, uh, <laughs> where I come from, pants don't have the same meaning. Um, <laughs> we call them okay. trousers, but I know what you mean. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I, what we did um, we had one office in our house uh, and a number of spare bedrooms, and we've converted one of our bedrooms into an office for me and a schoolroom for my daughter. And uh, so we've been sitting in here, and she's been doing her schoolwork while I've been working. Uh, but what I've done is moved my office so that I can actually have a view. And my office prior to it was in her playroom and it was you know, at the back of the house. Now I can actually look out and, and uh, we look straight down the Arrow Valley. So it's a great place to to look at the world go by. Um, my husband tends to send me a text message about 5.30 saying it's time to knock off now. Your commute home has started. And I walk downstairs and generally we'll uh, have a drink with him while we're cooking dinner. So that's something that we've done. But the other thing I've gotten into is making bread. So I do that first thing in the morning. And then as a because I have to look after it and you know give it a big stretch every hour, that gets me out of my chair to go down, stretch my bread, and then go back upstairs again. So well, How's the bread going? It's going really well. Yeah, I've, been, uh, I've nailed it, the sourdough this week, so I'm feeling quite proud of myself. Um, typical um, lockdown cliche, that's me. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I mean, I knew that the bread-making um, sales, bread-making machine sales were through the roof. I... Uh... <laughs> It was like number one or two product in yeah in I, i've gone for the artisan approach so i'm um, hand making mine and uh yeah so I've, I've had many failures before i had success 
Like, that's it, that's the, and, the uh, key to innovation. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, yeah, I'm, I'm coming to you from the garage. I'm sure that um, you probably heard the car just move a minute ago. <laughs> so fantastic. I love, uh, I love the challenges of, of the recording. Um, and um, yeah, look, any, any, um, so we, I guess we ended on trends there. Um, any, any final, any final words, I guess, to, um, or advice to anyone, you know, stuck in the, in their head. I mean, I think we all are right at this point, mm. but um, um, anything that just kind of to help um, people that are listening in terms of reimagining, let's just finish on the, on the tag one. Well, for me, I mean, I'm about to embark on that myself. So I'm um, actually finishing up at Asahi at the end of this month. And so I'll be spending the next few months reimagining what's next for me. And I think, you know, every situation that you're in like this is an opportunity. And you can take the time to, to think, and I'm, I'm fortunate I can take the time to think about what's next. Um, it's coming into summer, so I've, I'm actually going to take some gardening leave and do my garden. <laughs> and uh, I think... Reimagining is about giving yourself the space to, to think about what else could be. I think there's some great examples through the pandemic of where companies have, have basically lost their business overnight and had to make a change. And one of my favorite ones, if, if people haven't seen it, is Stage Kings that build the, the stages for you know, major, major shows around Australia. And they've, they've reimagined their business to make home office furniture out of all of the equipment that they build stages and sets from. Really cool. And, and I think, you know, if you can find a way to think about what have you got that others might need, maybe there's no need for it right now, but uh, and work on that. I think you know, that's certainly what I'll be planning to do over the next few months, is, and is it, thinking around what's next. Does that become, um, you know, now I think, um, you know, I, I had a, a chat with, um, I'm trying to think of the business they do, um, social impact, but the idea that companies are now thinking more, are you, are you thinking and, and more about purpose? And I mean, it's kind of yeah, just definitely. like, you know, there's, there has been this kind of, you know, what's the meaning of life, you know, <laughs> kind of, you know, kind of thing going on. Um, yeah. Is that kind of, is that driving y y your thought process? Yeah, it is. I think, you know, one of the things I love about my job at the moment is, is helping people to discover their creative side. And I think that can come from any part of the business. I think innovation happens in the factory floor. It happens in the sales team when they're out in the trade. It happens, you know, within HR. Some of the most um, fun projects I've worked on in our innovation culture have actually been with our HR team, reimagining how we might do recruitment or, um, you know, employee or talent management or, or um, learning and development plans. And, and I think, you know, for me, you know, what's next involves thinking about how do you capture what you're good at what gives you passion? What makes you want to jump out of bed? Um, and, and just do that. Great. I love it. Thank you very much for your time today, Anna. Um, really appreciate it. Um, you're welcome, Chris. And um, yeah, glad you're a guest on Reimagine. Thank you. Thank you.